Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Now we're just 12 o'clock. Um, you're very welcome. My name is Vivian Hanrahan, and I am the webinar coordinator of the HRB TMRN webinar series. I'd like to welcome everyone today for joining us for the webinar, and we're especially uh, delighted to welcome today Brennan Cahan. Uh, Brennan is giving the webinar today on the subject of the re randomization of design in clinical trials. So quick bio on you, Brennan. So Brennan is a lecturer in, the medic in medical statistics in the Pragmatic Clinical Trials Unit at Queen Mary University of London. Over the past six years, he has led research into the design and analysis of re-randomization trials. And re-randomization trials involve re-enrolling and re-randomizing patients each time they experience a new treatment episode. So this design has been used in areas such as asthma, where re-enrollment for each new exacerbation in um, influenza vaccines with re-enrollment for each new influenza season and complications with cirrhosis with re-enrollment with each new admission to hospital. Re-randomization offers the potential to increase recruitment compared to parallel group trials and provide more relevant estimates of treatment effectiveness. So you're very welcome, Brennan. Um, before we, I hand over to you, I just want to remind everyone that's joining us uh, at the webinar, if you hover your cursor over the bottom of the screen, um, a toolbar will highlight. And on that toolbar, you'll see the Q&A box. If you click on that and just add in any question you might have or any feedback you have while the uh, presentation's going on. And then at the end, I'll put your questions to Brennan. So good morning, Brennan. And with that, I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Um, so like Vivian said, I am going to be talking about the re-randomization design for clinical trials. So I'm going to talk today about what is a re-randomization trial, why we might want to consider using re-randomization in our own trials. I'll give some examples of trials that have been done using re-randomization. I'll go into some of the statistical aspects of re-randomization trials. Um, I'll compare them with other designs we might think about using, and I'll finish with discussing some common misconceptions about re-randomization trials. So let's start with what is a re-randomization trial? Well, most clinical trials start because somebody requires treatment, usually because they're ill. So we recruit them into the trial and we randomize them to one of several interventions. And we follow them up and we collect outcomes to find out what happened. And once their follow-up period is complete, they are done in the trial. However, in some settings, people who have participated in the trial and have finished their follow-up period might come back um, later because they need treatment again. So this is an example of a multi-episode setting, which just means that some patients might experience one or more uh, treatment episodes. They might require treatment on more than one occasion. So some examples of this are patients who have sickle cell disease often experience acute sickle cell pain crises. And so these patients will require treatment to manage pain for each new crisis that they experience. People with severe asthma exacerbations will require treatment to manage symptoms for each new exacerbation they experience. And people undergoing IVF to become pregnant may undergo several cycles of IVF before they do become pregnant. So in trials in these areas where some patients might require treatment on more than one occasion, the question is, what do we do with a patient who's been enrolled in the trial and has completed follow-up who comes back and requires treatment again? Well, in a parallel group trial, patients can only be enrolled for one episode. So in parallel group trials, people who complete the trial and require further treatment are no longer eligible to participate. So they are excluded from the trial. In the re-randomization trial, people who complete the trial and come back because they require further treatment they can be re-enrolled into the trial and re-randomized. So the basic outline of the re-randomization design is shown in this figure on the right-hand side. So people can re-enroll into the trial 
and be re-randomized for each new treatment episode experience. And one important uh, point about re-randomization trials is we don't specify the number of episodes that someone will be enrolled in the trial in advance. So we don't set out at the beginning of the trial and say, we want everyone to be enrolled for two episodes. Um, the number of times that each person is enrolled depends on entirely on their treatment needs. So how many times they require treatment. So when can we actually use re-randomization in trials? Well, it needs to be a multi-episode setting, so where some people require treatment more than once. It needs to be with interventions that we would intend to be used uh, to treat each new episode. And it needs to be interventions that are relatively short term and for follow up periods that are also relatively short term, at least compared to the overall length of the trial recruitment period. So I will give you an example. So imagine we're doing a trial of ibuprofen versus placebo in patients with sickle cell disease who experience acute sickle cell pain crises. Um, so pain crises are typically treated using opioids um, to manage pain, which while opioids can be quite effective, they also have quite severe side effects. So if we're able to use ibuprofen to reduce the amount of opioid patients needed for each sickle cell pain crisis while still controlling overall pain, this could be quite helpful for participants. So in this example, um, this is a multi-episode setting um, because people who experience acute sickle cell pain crises, some of them would likely experience more than one pain crisis during the trial. If ibuprofen was found to be effective at treating pain, then it's likely that this would be used in practice for each pain crisis a patient experienced. And the intervention is fairly short term, so most stays in hospital for acute sickle cell pain crises only last a few days, and the follow up period will also likely be fairly short. So this is a setting where re randomization would be appropriate. So in terms of designing a re randomization trial, there are only two design requirements. Um, so the first design requirement is that patients can only be re-enrolled into the trial and randomized once the um, follow-up period from their previous enrollment is complete. So we can't re-enroll someone while we're still collecting outcomes or anything like that. Uh, so we can't have any overlapping enrollment periods. The second design requirement is that randomizations for the same patient have to be independent. And what this means is that the treatment allocation in a patient's second episode should not be affected by what treatment they received in their first episode. So for example, we can't use patient um, as a stratification factor in the randomization uh, procedure to kind of balance allocations within patients. Um, so each allocation needs to be done independently. So why would we think about using re-randomization? Well, let's start with thinking about what the limitations of allowing only one episode per patient to be enrolled into a trial might be. So the first issue is that doing this, we are excluding a potentially very large portion of available episodes. And this can have an impact on recruitment because there are just fewer episodes available to recruit. The second issue is that these trials are often used to inform results across all episodes rather than just the um, first episode. So including the episodes that are excluded by the design. So in the sickle cell trial example I gave, if ibuprofen was found to be effective, this would likely be used to treat all sickle cell pain crises. And the issue with this design, which allows only one episode per patient, 
is it evaluates safety and the effectiveness of the intervention um, using a single episode per patient. And then it extrapolates this treatment effect from a single episode per patient into all the other episodes. And this extrapolation may not be very accurate. So we can imagine some treatments might become less effective each time they're used, or some treatments might become more toxic or have um, more safety issues the more often they are used. And so a design that allows only one episode per patient has no way of assessing this. So in a re-randomization trial, it is able to increase the recruitment rate compared to parallel group design or trials that allow only one episode per patient because it allows re-enrollment of all eligible episodes. Similarly, in re-randomization trials, we can estimate treatment effects across all episodes for which an intervention might be used. Um, so we don't need any sort of extrapolation. We can directly assess whether interventions might be safe and effective across all episodes. So I will give a few examples of trials that have used re-randomization in practice. So this trial looked at an intervention uh, to manage symptoms for children um, who experienced uh, acute asthma exacerbations. So children could be re-enrolled and re-randomized for each new exacerbation they experienced. So this trial enrolled 158 episodes from 72 participants. So by using re-randomization, they actually doubled the number of episodes they enrolled compared to if they had allowed only one episode per patient. And they actually completed recruitment um, almost four years earlier than they would have if they had tried to recruit 158 individual participants. So in this trial, they found that the intervention reduced the duration of the respiratory episode by a fair amount, so it was effective, and there was no increase in adverse events. This trial uh, compared high-dose influenza vaccine against standard-dose influenza vaccine in adults, and so participants could be re-enrolled and re-randomized at the beginning of each new vaccine influenza season. So this trial enrolled just under 32,000 episodes from a little over 24,000 participants. So they increased the number of episodes enrolled by just over 30% compared to if they had used a parallel group design. And they finished recruitment a year earlier than they would have had they were tried to recruit just under 32,000 individual participants. So they found that the high dose vaccine um, reduced influenza and also had a small reduction in the number of adverse events. And finally, this trial looked at whether the amount of light had any impact on the time it took an operator to complete a biophysical profile of a pregnant woman. And women were allowed to be re-enrolled and randomized each time they came in for a new biophysical profile. And this trial enrolled 357 episodes from 224 participants. So a 59% increase in the number of episodes recruited. And they completed recruitment just under a year earlier than they would have had they tried to recruit 357 individual participants. And they found there was no difference between um, the two treatment groups in terms of the time required to complete the biophysical profile. So in these trials, using re-randomization allowed the investigators to complete recruitment earlier than they would have had they uh, allowed only one episode per patient to be enrolled, allowed them to save on resources because the trials were completed more quickly, and it let them obtain estimates of the treatment um, as it would be used across all episodes rather than requiring any sort of extrapolation from the first episode to all subsequent episodes. 
So I'll talk about some of these statistical aspects about re-randomization trials now. So I'll start off talking about what are some of the questions that we might want to know about the intervention in multi-episode settings. I'll go on to talk about some analysis aspects, and then I'll talk about sample size calculations in re-randomization trials. So what question might we want to ask about the intervention in multi-episode settings? It turns out that there are actually a few questions we could ask, and I'm gonna focus on two of these in this talk. So the first question is what is called the policy benefit treatment effect. So this is the effect of a treatment policy where patients receive either intervention across all episodes or they receive control across all episodes. So let's take patient two here as an example. So this patient experiences two episodes in this trial. And the way the policy benefit effect calculates the treatment effect in the second episode is it compares patients who got treatment A at the second episode and also got treatment A at the first episode against patients who got treatment B at the episode, uh, second episode, who also had treatment B in the first episode. So it compares um, patients at the second episode along treatment policy basis. So patients who got A for every episode against patients who got B for every episode. The second question or second treatment effect that I'm going to talk about is what is called the added benefit treatment effect. And this treatment effect uh, gives the additional benefit of receiving the intervention in a current episode over and above any benefit the patient rece uh, receives from having received the intervention in previous episodes. So again, using patient number two as an example, the way that the added benefit treatment effect calculates the treatment effect at the second episode is it compares uh, patients who got A at this episode against patients who got B at this episode, assuming a common treatment history for these patients. So assuming that they received the same intervention or same treatment in episode one. So I'll try to illustrate the kind of differences between these two treatment effects using an example. So imagine we have a situation where the treatment effect carries forward. And what I mean by that is imagine if you get treatment B in the first episode and treatment B makes you feel better. So it improves your health and you go on feeling better until the beginning of your second episode. And so actually you start your second episode feeling better. So at a higher level, if you receive treatment B in the first episode, than you would if you had received treatment A in the first episode. So the way the policy benefit effect uh, calculates the treatment effect here at the second episode is it allows participants to start the episode two at different levels, depending what treatment they received in the first episode. Um, the reason being is that this recognizes, uh, the policy benefit effect recognizes that if you're starting episode two at a better level because you received episode B in the first uh, you received treatment B in the first episode, um, this is kind of part of the benefit of being on a treatment policy is treatment effects might carry forward and you might start different episodes at a higher level. Conversely, the added benefit effect would calculate the treatment effect at the second episode as if all participants had started the episode at the same level, so based on a common treatment history. Um, because the purpose of this treatment effect is to say how much additional benefit are you receiving from the treatment in this episode over and above any benefit you may have received from getting the treatment in previous episodes. 
So we have several different questions we might want to answer about our intervention and how do we go about addressing these questions in a re-randomization trial? Well, I'll start with the added benefit effect. So this effect um, is actually quite simple to estimate in a re-randomization trial. Um, it's actually just taking the difference in means between all the episodes who got intervention versus all the episodes who got the control in your trial. And the easiest way to do this is to use what are called independence estimators. Um, so this is an analysis method that may, uses a working independence correlation structure, which just means it makes the working assumption that all episodes are independent. Um, and this can be used in conjunction with robust standard errors that allow for the fact that episodes within patients are clustered and actually probably not independent. And the important thing about this um, analysis method is in re-randomization trials, it can provide unbiased estimates of the added benefit effect and valid results. So correct confidence intervals and p-values. So we're able in re-randomization trials to get um, good estimates of the added benefit treatment effect. And just to show you that this isn't actually that complicated to implement. Um, so this is the way that you would implement this analysis in the statistical software package Stata. Um, so really we would just need to do a regression model of the outcome on treatment group and then add in a command at the end that calculates robust standard errors. So it's a little more complicated than in a parallel group trial, but not actually all that much. So for the policy benefit estimate, um, we can also get this from a re-randomization trial. Um, again, we can use independence estimators, although this isn't quite as easy to get as the added benefit effect is. So for the policy benefit effect, we need to first specify a statistical model um, for the impact that treatment history has. Um, so the treatment allocations in previous episodes. So what effect do they have on the current episode? So for example, do we think that if we receive treatment B in the previous episode, there's some sort of carryover effect on what happens in the current episode? And based on this statistical model, we can then get an overall estimate of the policy benefit treatment effect. So in a re-randomization trial, the policy benefit effect estimate will be unbiased um, if two things are true. Um, the first is we need to get the statistical model for impact of treatment history correct. And what that means is, for example, if treatment in the previous episode does carry forward and affect um, our outcome in the current episode, we need to have correctly included that in our model. The second assumption we need is that there is no differential non-enrollment between treatment groups. And what this means is that the types of patients who re-enroll in the trial are not different between treatment groups. So for example, the people who got intervention in episode one and re-enroll in the trial for episode two are not fundamentally different to the patients who got control in the first episode and re-enroll in episode two. And if these two things are the case, then we are able to get unbiased estimates of the policy benefit effect in a re-randomization trial. So in terms of sample size, um, the sample size calculation for an added benefit effect is actually, turns out to be very easy. It turns out we can actually use the same sample size calculation as from a parallel group trial. And instead of recruiting the required number of individual patients, we can recruit that many episodes. So for example, um, if we do a sample size calculation for a parallel group trial and we need, uh, it says we need to recruit 200 patients, we could use a re-randomization trial and recruit 200 episodes instead. 
for the policy benefit effect, there aren't currently any sample size formulas available, although we still can get um, sample size estimates using computer simulation. So I'll talk about comparison of re-randomization trials with other designs at the moment. So I'll talk about parallel group trials, which we've already discussed a little bit, as well as crossover trials and cluster randomized trials. So parallel group trials allow uh, patients to be enrolled into the trial for one treatment episode only. So these trials answer the question, how effective is the intervention the first time it is used? Um, so if that is your main question, if that is what you want to know about the intervention, then actually parallel group trials are very effective at answering this question. And it's unlikely that any other design is going to do a better job of it than a parallel group trial. However, if you want to know about the treatment effect across all episodes for which the treatment might be used, for example, the added benefit or policy benefit effects, the parallel group trial um, has to extrapolate uh, to these episodes based on the effect in one patient, uh, one episode per patient. And as we discussed earlier, this extrapolation may not be that good. Um, so if we are making decisions about whether an intervention should be used across all episodes um, rather than in only the first episode, parallel group trials um, may not good, uh, give very reliable results. The other potential downside to the parallel group trial is they can be less efficient um, in the sense that they can take much longer to complete recruitment because we are limited to recruiting only one episode per patient. So crossover designs, these are trials that do allow re-enrollment. Um, and what they do is patients cross over to different treatments between episodes. So a patient who's allocated to treatment A in their first episode then crosses over to treatment B in their second episode and vice versa. So the main benefit from a crossover design is that it can increase uh, statistical power and precision compared to re-randomization trials, um, and often by quite a substantial amount. The issue with crossover trials is that they're only able to give unbiased estimates of treatment effect when the treatment history, so what interventions or what treatments you received in previous episodes, when this has no impact on what happens in the current episode. So if there is any sort of carryover effect, so for example, um, treat, getting treatment B in the first episode affects your outcome in the second episode, or if the treatment becomes less effective each time it is used, Crossover trials give quite biased results and quite unreliable treatment effect estimates. The other potential issue in crossover trials is they do not maintain allocation concealment. And what I mean by this is if you're a patient in a crossover trial and you're allocated to treatment A in your first episode, then you know that in your second episode, you're going to get treatment B. And this might affect your decision to re-enroll in the trial, depending on whether you would like to get treatment B in your next episode. Um, and so this can potentially lead to selection bias and again, unreliable estimates of treatment effect. And a cluster design, this is a trial design where patients are allocated to a treatment policy for all episodes they experience. So for example, a patient might be um, allocated to treatment A for every episode they experience or to treatment B for every episode they experience. And the potential benefit of this design is that it very closely matches the policy benefit treatment effect. And that means that in a cluster trial, you're able to get a very, um, very easily estimate the policy benefit effect. Um, so you don't need to 
um, come up with any sort of statistical model to get this effect as you would in a re-randomization trial. Um, however, cluster designs still do require the assumption of no differential non-enrollment. Um, so there aren't different types of people on different treatment groups groups who re-enroll for the second episode um, in order to obtain unbiased estimates of treatment effect. So the same assumption as we would make in a re-randomization trial for the policy benefit effect. And similar to crossover trials, um, cluster trials also do not maintain allocation concealment. So if a patient is allocated to treatment A in the first episode, then they know that they're going to get treatment A for all subsequent episodes, and similarly for treatment B. Um, so this again could potentially lead to patients not returning to the trial for the next episode, depending on whether they are happy or not with what their treatment might be. Um, the other potential downside to cluster trials is we're not able to estimate added benefit effects um, from these designs. Um, but that's really only a downside if you're interested in an added benefit treatment effect. If the only thing you're interested in is a policy benefit effect, then that's not an issue. So I'm just going to finish by going through a couple of common misconceptions about re-randomization trials. Um, so there is a misconception that re-randomization trials are problematic because they violate the statistical assumption of independence. And so it is true that in a re-randomization trial, episodes from the same patient are likely to be correlated. So um, those episodes from the same patient are likely to be more similar to each other than they are to episodes from other patients. However, this is not a problem. Um, so many trial designs have similar issues of clustering where the assumption of independence is not true. So for example, cluster randomized trials where we randomize groups of people, crossover trials, N of one trials, or any trial that has any sort of repeated measurement. Um, in these trials, independence is likely not true and there is some correlation. However, these trials can still provide valid results as long as we account for this uh, non-independence in the design and analysis. And it's the same issue in re-randomization trials where we are still able to obtain valid results um, regardless of correlation between episodes. The second misconception is that re-randomization trials shouldn't be done if we anticipate carryover effects from the treatment. Um, so again, carryover effects, what this uh, basically means is if treatment history, so the treatment allocation in previous episodes affects what happens in the current episode. Um, and this is a very common requirement for crossover trials. So it's generally recommended that crossover trials should not be done if carryover effects are anticipated. However, this is not a requirement for re-randomization trials. Um, and this is partly because the carryover effects are implicitly incorporated into the treatment effect definitions. So for example, the policy benefit uh, treatment effect already allows for the fact that there may be some carryover and that people at a certain episode might have different outcomes depending on what they've received in previous outcome, uh, previous episodes. Um, so in re-randomization trials, we're actually still able to obtain unbiased estimates of treatment effect and valid results, regardless of whether there is carryover. And actually, if treatments do carry over, that might be an argument for using something like a re-randomization trial, because this does have important implications for the treatment effect and how, it is, how treatments are used in practice. So for example, if treatments become less effective the more often they're used, 
or more toxic or have greater safety concerns, the more often that they are used, then actually we probably want to know about this and using re-randomization or a similar trial design is one of the only ways to do this. And finally, um, there is sometimes concern that results from re-randomization trials can be skewed um, by patients who have a large number of episodes. So for example, if we imagine a trial where most patients are enrolled for only two or three episodes, but one patient is enrolled for 20 episodes, the results for this trial are going to be more weighted towards the single patient enrolled for 20 episodes. In practice, I, I think this is extremely uncommon. So most of the published random re-randomization trials, most patients are only enrolled for a fairly small number of episodes without any kind of one patient dominating the number of episodes. Um, but if this is a concern, um, this is something that can be handled at the design stage of the trial. So we can place a maximum limit on the number of times a patient is enrolled. So for example, we can say patients can only be re-enrolled and re-randomized for a maximum of three or four episodes, for example. And this can actually also be handled at the analysis stage if we want, um, if it's a concern. So we can actually take the average treatment effect across patients instead of across episodes, where in this analysis, each patient would contribute equally to the analysis. So the patient who it was enrolled for 20 episodes would contribute the same amount of information as a patient enrolled for only two episodes. Um, so if this is a concern, there are a number of things we can do to kind of limit the impact this might have on results. So to conclude, um, re-randomization trials can be useful in multi-episode settings. So they can increase the recruitment rate and increase the efficiency of doing trials. Um, they can provide results or treatment effect estimates that are applicable to all episodes rather than requiring any sort of extrapolation um, from the first episode to all subsequent episodes. And they are flexible in that they can answer multiple questions about the intervention. So for example, both the policy benefit effect and added benefit effect. However, uh, re-randomization trials are not always necessarily the best design for every single trial. Um, whether it's appropriate or the best choice for a particular trial will depend on the specific setting and the specific question of interest. And re-randomization trials uh, do require some additional methodological complexity. Um, so it's often not that much additional complexity compared to parallel group trials, but there is a bit. So if you are thinking of doing a re-randomization trial, it would be useful to include a statistician or a methodologist with some experience in these trial designs. Um, so if you are interested in potentially using re-randomization or finding out more about it, here are some articles that um, explain more of the methodological aspects of this design. And if you have any questions, uh, please do feel free to get in touch. You can either um, get in touch over Twitter or over email. And I should let you know that I'll be moving institutions at the end of November. Um, so if you send me an email after November 27th, uh, in my out of office reply, I will have my new email address and you can get in touch there. So thank you. Thank you very much, Brennan. That was really, really interesting. Um, I just want to remind everyone at home, if you have any questions to um, pop them into the Q&A box there at the bottom of your screen, hover over that little toolbar and you'll be able to put your question in there. So um, a couple of questions I have here for you, Brennan. Um, so the, the first one really was about uh, how do you decide whether re-randomization is the right design for your trial? So I think you've probably touched on that there at the end, but um, I just found that really um, interesting to find out, like, who, how do you decide um, whether that's the way to go? Like, what would be the sort of most swaying factors? Um, yes, yeah, so I think there are two things that come into play there. So I think the first is we need to figure out is it a setting that's appropriate for re-randomization trials? Um, so are some patients going to potentially require treatment 
on more than one occasion? Is it a multi-episode setting? Um, is it an intervention that in practice would be used across each treatment episode? And is the intervention um, and follow-up period going to be relatively short compared to the overall trial duration? Mm -hmm. And then if it is appropriate, then I think we need to think about what our main question of interest about the intervention is. So do we just really care about the treat, uh, intervention effect the first time it is used, or do we want to get more of an effect across episodes? Um, because if it's just, we're just interested in the effect the first time it's used, then actually a parallel group trial is probably fine. If we want an effect across episodes, um, then we need to think more, a bit more about which effect do we want? Do we want policy benefit or added benefit effects? Um, and then we can decide on either a re-randomization trial for those, or if we're only interested in a policy bene ben benefit effect, then perhaps cluster trial might be more appropriate. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and also another question I had just because I'm coming at it from sort of a recruitment perspective myself. Um, how do you go about offering re-randomization as a trial to uh, potential participants? Is it something that's mentioned at the initial recruitment stage or something you come to after that patient's gone through the um, trial process? Um, I think that would depend on the specific nature of the trial, but in every trial I've seen, it's something that would just be offered again each time the patient kind of requires more treatment. Um, so uh, it usually isn't discussed at the kind of very uh, enrollment for the first episode um, saying, oh, by the way, you can re-enroll again if you want, but rather it's kind of taken on an episode by episode basis where they ask them again each time and patients can either um, decide to re-enroll each time or not. Um, but again, there might be some situations where it would be easier to do it kind of at the outset. Yeah, I'm just wondering, because if someone has a, a negative experience with the trial intervention, they would be probably then less likely to re-enroll, um, unless I suppose, I suppose it depends how it's offered to them, um, the re-randomization of, of, you know, the other treatment options available. Um, yeah, sorry, just thinking out loud there. <laughs> Another question we have just coming in there on the Q&A session is, um, is it advantageous to know what the policy benefit might be before the trial, i.e. maybe from other trials where the parallel design has been used? That's a question from Jan. Um, yeah, I mean, it would be quite useful to have some sense of what that might be. I, I think the issue is it's often quite difficult to know what that would be in advance um, in the sense that even if there have been previous trials, previous parallel group trials, those don't necessarily give us the policy benefit, um, at least not without kind of some extra assumptions about the treatment effect. Um, so I think it's generally quite difficult to get that in advance. And that's sort of one of the reasons we might need to do a re-randomization trial is to be able to kind of estimate policy benefit effects um, more easily. Mm -hmm. Very good. And also another question we have here is, um, how do journal editors and funding bodies feel about re-randomization trials? Um, yeah, that's a good question. So re-randomization trials, it's a fairly new methodological design. Um, so I think some people are worried that if they use re-randomization in their trial, um, they might kind of come into a barrier with funding bodies or journal editors. Um, that's not been my experience so far though. Um, so for example, a few of the re-randomization trials I brought up in this talk, one of them was published in the New England Journal, one of them was published in the Lancet Respiratory Medicine, um, and there have been other trials that have been published in kind of high impact journals. So it doesn't seem to be a barrier to getting published, um, and I do know of one trial that was funded by the NIHR HTA that used a re-randomization design. Um, so at the moment, it doesn't seem like this kind of using re-randomization is a barrier to getting funded or published. Although, of course, I can't speak for every editor or um, funding body out there. Mm -hmm. Gosh, that's good. It's, it's, it's new and, and, and up and coming. Um, okay, I think if we have any more questions, let's just double check. No, no more questions coming in at the moment. So um, that's really, really, really 
good um Brennan, really helpful. Um, your slides were excellent, very clear and very easy to follow for the likes of me who don't have any background in this at all. So that was really, really interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just a quick uh, reminder for everyone's diary of uh, for the HRB TMRN. We're having our fifth annual symposium in Dublin this December. It's on December the 6th in uh, Malahide. And it's a flagship networking event uh, hosted by Trinity College Dublin. So it's a really um, really useful sort of gathering of minds and that's on the 6th of December and um, so thanks very much Brennan for joining us and thanks everyone joining us on the webinar and um, it's been really helpful all the uh, the slide and the presentation will be put up on the HTM uh, sorry HRB TMRN website so you'll be able to log on and have a look at that if you want to go back over any of the references or anything like that that's Brennan's given us so thanks very much again Brennan and um, yeah so let's let's um, see what happens in the future and how many more of these get published. I'll be interesting to keep an eye on this. Thank you. Thanks very much. Okay. Bye-bye everyone. <laughs>